Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Vallejo Values Podcast. I am your host, Carter Hockman. Today's guest is the president and founder of Vallejo Football Club, Emilio Williams. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Emilio. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So before we delve into everything, we're going to turn back the clock a few years. Just tell me how you first got into soccer altogether. Uh, when I was born, and then there was a ball, and then it's always been that way. <laughs> so we've always played from, from from as far as I could remember. I mean, growing up playing soccer, it's it's such a positive outlet for so many kids, no matter how early or how even how late you start playing. Uh, was there a point for you where you realized the impact that soccer was beginning to have in your life? Um, well, I mean, to be honest, uh, f- uh, soccer, football has always been part of my life. So I've never, I guess the only time I've realized how important it has been has been when when I didn't have it because I was hurt or I couldn't play or train or one of those things, you know. Um, but I've pretty much played every single day of my life. I mean, it's youth development in in soccer is being thrust more and more into the spotlight, especially in the U.S. Yeah, and, and it goes without saying just how important it is to grow the game at such a young age. I mean, what have you seen that's been trending in the right direction, and what still needs to be improved with youth development? Um, I think the U.S. Um, as an entity do a, does a, quite a few things quite well. Largely, the organization of the various leagues, the the provision of just the opportunity to play. Um, we kind of take it for granted, but it's not so in every country of the world. I think uh, for y- true youth development to take place, when I was younger, um, you know, we had free play. We played every day of, you know, we could go play with our friends. We had lots of opportunities to experiment and try new things. And we always spoke about the game, played the game. Was at, we got to school early just to play, played at recess, played at lunch, played. Um, in this current construct, I hear our young kids talking about, you know, play dates. They have to schedule things. Um, and I think in some sense, um, adults have hijacked um, the impromptu play, um, free-spirited play that usually is the domain of kids. So I think for us, we just need to focus on the kids um, and focus on them having a positive experience and them having a space to freely create. Um, I think right now we're, we suffer from overcoaching and too much, like literally too much, too many adults in the system. So, I mean, so what have you seen? What's what's trending in the right direction that you've seen over the last couple of years? Because we have seen some definite concrete change. Um, well, the I would say on the international stages, the American players um, having success in Europe um, and playing at the highest level. Um, I think the quality of um, play um, on and some of the higher in the higher leagues have definitely improved. I think the tactical intelligence. Um, of the players have you know gotten much better. Um, the technical um, aspects of the game have gotten much better, um, at least from what I've seen. You know, and there's a lot more thought that goes into in uh, in the games now, as opposed to I think back in the days. It would, you know we were reliant on the biggest, strongest kids <laughs> and the early developers, or you know the fast kid up front. But now we're seeing that there's an f- emphasis on technique and tactics. I feel like there's a lot we can take from these giant European clubs that have such robust youth development programs. Like we always hear about the, the Youth Barcelona program and things like that. I mean, what can we take from, you know, as American soccer clubs, what can we take from those big European clubs that they're doing so well? Um, I think the, the, the thing that those clubs have is history. You know, they've been around for a century you know so over with that rich of a history you have just a large body of alums and fans that all understand intrinsically what the culture is of the given you know club and they you know when the kids enter that club they understand that it's not about necessarily about them but about the the club the badge the history and those things um i think just like you know i think 
the U.S. has done a really good job of, you know, studying um, the academies and the clubs that have been successful um, and, you know, trying to replicate those things. The, the DA um, Development Academy, before it got disbanded, I thought was doing an excellent job of just identifying best practices and creating standards that the clubs that are participating in academies had to adhere to. So I think on a from from a high level we've been doing a very good job um in terms of you know just improving the quality at the highest level but the game is a player's game you know and i think even though it made the optics on the outside look good and this and that we need to play more and when i say play more kids need to have more spaces where they could express themselves where there are no adults where you know where they could just play and experiment with the ball and come up with new things and liberate their minds um, how the game now is you know there's an adult at every practice telling you what to do and you know the Europeans know that it's a player's game it's not a coach's or, a, or an administrator's game Moving back towards the youth development aspect of everything, I feel like the most critical time in youth development, in my opinion, is when you get to high school. Because that's when the pace of just about everything speeds up, the pace of play ramps up, your body is still growing, you're becoming a more and more independent human being, college is right around the corner. It can be an incredibly stressful time for a young soccer player. What is the most important thing to focus on as a soccer player at that age, in your opinion? Well, I, I'm going to diff, provide a different opinion. Sure. I think the most important time in the development is what happens before year 10. You know, obviously, there are different stages of a player's life um, or a player's um, life cycle. You know, the player, uh, you know, 6 to 10 is when you learn a lot of things and, you know, the world is wide open and there's no restrictions. So um, here at Vallejo, we do, you know, have a heavy emphasis on trying to create an atmosphere, an environment that teaches creativity. You know, we always say that some coaches are always going to tell you what you can't do and whatnot. What we try to do is just to make sure that we empower each player, you know, and say that, hey, you could be the next Neymar, you could be the next, you know, Ronaldo or the next R9 or whoever. Um, but moving further along at, at high school, at high school, you know, the, 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 the focus kind of changes. There's a lot of um, different factors that go in, you know, players are getting a little bit more mature, you know, um, you know, the onset of, you know, puberty and adolescence and teenage angst and all those things, not to mention the, in this country, the pressures of parents trying to get their kids into college and you trying to make the best decisions. Um, so a lot of things really um, are, are a lot of different influences happen are, are acting on a player and people don't don't understand the stress of it um the thing about it that's why we try to make sure that the game remains fun and that the game remains the players and to say hey we're doing these things because of you and you know uh you know soccer is a means that you're going to you, you know allow you to express yourself it's an escape from what you're you know the external pressures it also is going to open doors for you and you know and you know and so we just try to remain um, remind each player that it's really about them and it's about your game and the love of the game. Now, obviously, if you do the things right at the at the you know, base of the pyramid when they're younger, um, you know the game is fun and that is your that is your you know or your sanctuary that when you're on the field and you know so those things are important. Absolutely, it's it's one of those things that I think Vallejo does an incredible job with is reminding everyone who comes through the door here is that this game is supposed to be fun and you're supposed to enjoy yourself while you do it. <laughs> yeah. And, and that, you know, it, it is an outlet for so many kids to have that avenue for not only, you know, development in soccer, but you develop as a person here as well. You develop in life. Yeah, no, it's true. I mean, you know, it's where you're going to meet new friends and have, you know, uh, learn teamwork and commitment and, you know, shared joy and shared pain, you know, um, and, you know, you, you, you set goals. And um, so we it's not lost on us um, that we have to remind, hey, it's a game. It's supposed to be fun, um, you know, but, you know, we have little little mini elite athletes here. They're very focused and driven. And, you know, so, we, you know, so everyone has different goals. So, but we try to say, hey, the when you love what you do, truly love what you do, you never work a day in your life. So 
Um, but yeah. You ended up founding Valeo in 2008. So bear with me because this is a loaded question, but why? I mean, what, what were you seeing that you knew you could do differently and, and better than the clubs <coughs> that were and are currently out there? I mean, talk me through your journey from, okay, I have this idea to start a new soccer club to come try out for Vallejo. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's kind of a loaded question. <laughs> but um, uh, part of it is, you know, you know I've, I've, I'm from Jamaica and I, and I moved here. I played for Oakwood, which is in Connecticut. Um, you know, hi, Dave. Hi, Rick. Um, shout out no, to Oakwood. Shout out to Oakwood. Um, you know, great club and people. And I worked there. They gave me a job. So I had a good idea of, oh, wow, these guys really do go above and beyond for kids and, you know, provide a really positive experience. They helped me find a college, you know, said, no, not this school, not this school, this school, you know, that type of thing. Um, so I had a very good sense uh, of the power of a club, um, you know, but, you know, coaching for as many years of, you know, I realized that, oh, you know, the, the, the players, I wanted to create a, a club or an academy more so that turned out X factor players. Um, there are plenty of clubs that do a good job of turning out utility and role players. You know, they're not going to make too many mistakes, but they're pretty average. What we wanted to do is to break the mold and to break the mold is what we're trying to create number 10s in a, in a, back in the old days, there's only one number 10 on the field and that's the creative guy. Um, but so in creating the first, uh, I would say, um, training Bible. I literally looked, studied every street ball move. Um, back in the days when I was younger and slimmer, and I was a, a really, I'm a... You're still just, slim, come on. Yeah, yeah, yes, by some standards. Um, I was a, I'm a dribbler, and, uh, and I'm a playmaker, and I, I see the game a little bit differently than most. So I wanted to create players that, like, truly were, like, creative, and to create an environment to do that. You know, um, I had to study a lot of different things. You know, how do young people learn? Um, I looked at basketball, I looked at football, uh, I looked at just the methods of teaching, you know, like, you know, what created Michael Jordan? You know, um, what are the, you know, what did, what was Kobe's journey like? You know, what was Adrian Peterson, if you know, Barry Sanders in the open field? So I looked at a lot of different sports, you know, different environments and different ways of learning and you know um and then set out to try and create something um in that in my that was in my mind like a perfect animal which is someone that is creative but also you know had the soldier mentality and in my mind that is a a perfect animal a, a free thinking um disciplined person as opposed to like a conditioned person and we always make that definition um the, the differentiation around here is the difference between someone that is disciplined who has their their internally power the motivation is internal versus a player that is or a soldier that is conditioned where they take their cues from outside whether it's the coach yelling at them or they're looking at their parents or whatever how did you land in, in newton massachusetts coming from connecticut <laughs> Uh, so I went to Southern Connecticut, you know, played there for many years. I worked with Oakwood, but then at some point I needed a change. A friend of mine was starting a, um, a software company in uh, soccer back in the days. <laughs> it, was, it, was, um, it was back in the dot-com era or whatever. And someone had the bright idea to give us like $2 million. <laughs> and so I moved to Cambridge. I packed up and I moved to Cambridge um, to work and work on this project um, and decide to stick around because I like Boston and Cambridge. <laughs> and it's a very cosmopolitan city. It's not too big and not too small. I mean, Vallejo at, at this point, and in, in... It has been for so many years, but it's an incredibly unique club, especially from the outside looking in. And I can't stress enough. I can't stress that enough coming from from my end. And, and you just talked a lot about it. But how has Vallejo continued to evolve and provide things to young players that other clubs just don't do or don't do well enough? Um, to be honest, we're not that privy or concerned with what other clubs do. Um, we are just concerned about we're on our own journey and. Um, you know, we're now in our 
14th year um, and our journey just is involves people so when I look at the guys that we started with and you know and when I see them five years later or ten years later you know that makes me just proud because you know we were on a journey at some point we're on a campaign at some point and we have a certain brotherhood or sisterhood if you're you know um, for all the ladies that have played um so you know we just try to do what's best for um the player and from the very start we've always said the player is number one um, so in our decision making it's always a player first then you know the coaches because they actually coach the player then the parents because they take care of the player <laughs> um, and then administrators and whatever else comes um, after so um, so that's always been our that where we're a little bit different is we're the focus on just the individual player a quote that comes to mind is something that you actually first told me when i first began here with the club is is you want to remain small but global yeah just talk to I me mean, for those who might not know what your vision is i mean what do you just elaborate on that. What do you mean when you say small but global? Because I think it's it's a wonderful it's a wonderful quote, and I think it can really define what this club is about. Yeah, I think <clears throat> when we started, you know, it was about football. You know, it was us. We we're trying to win a game on Sunday. We train during the week, and we come out on Sunday want to win. But over the time, I think that a lot of business has seeped into football. Um, you know, um, so. With that being said, our goal from the start was how do we create the resources? We wanted to be a resource-rich club, meaning that, you know, instead of economies of scale, which is what other clubs try to do, to try to get as big as possible because of, you know, revenue and whatnot, for us it's like economies of scope, is how much resources can we put into a person that allows them to reach their potential and so, so that is one of the, the one of the differences. The other part of it, I didn't, we didn't want to be bigger. The back in the days was, you know, GPS was very large. We never had any such aspirations. We wanted to be niche and the Ferrari of, you know, football as opposed to, you know, the Ford Taurus of football. You know what I mean? So, uh, nothing against Ford Taurus, um, <laughs> um, but we wanted to be niche, and we still are. We 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 are as a from a management perspective you know we've tried to be right size as opposed to this ever expanding expansion and and with no end in sight so we are we're very small and that's the way we like it and um in terms of being global the the whole world is out there and so we are ambassadors for you know, I tell the kids that they're ambassadors for their parents and their communities and the town and the club. So we're going to travel wherever there is competition. Um, so case in point, we're going to we go to Europe every year, and that's just to measure ourselves to see how we are relative to other you know players and clubs in um, the rest of the world, as opposed to staying locally and playing against the same clubs <laughs> year after year and not really growing. And, you know, to piggyback off of that and the global aspect, we, you know, we do have two significant presences in, in Jamaica and Portugal. I mean, coming from Jamaica, that's, it's, you know, it's an, it's a location that is obviously near and dear to you, but I mean, talk to me a little bit about why Portugal as well. I mean, what, and what the club has accomplished in both of these locations. Um, so, I mean, both projects are different. We're in a bunch of other different countries, um, but, you know, we have significant presence in Jamaica, um, because I'm from Jamaica. Secondly, uh, even though the in the United States we've, you know, COVID caused a hiccup for three months in 2020, in places like Jamaica, the kids it was two years, it wasn't three months. So the kids, so this year we organized the league, um, uh, you know, which took a while to plan um, and we're in the midst of creating hopefully a national league but um, but it's 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 literally modeled after like the development academy or any league here where you get to train you know three four times a week and you play on the weekend so in Jamaica we had to do everything because you know people literally were quarantined for two years 
um, no football, you know, no, no, no training, no organized leagues. So um, the minute the government said, hey, we're now a little bit free to move around, um, we jumped at it, you know, so gave everyone uniforms, you know, um, the coaches have been great, the clubs have been great. And what we plan, what our plans there are is just to develop a healthy ecosystem like what we have here um, in the U.S. We take it for granted, but um, in Jamaica or Trinidad or any of these other small countries, um, you'd be surprised of what is just missing. Um, so that's Jamaica. Um you know, we're just going to try and scale the league. I think we have 15 clubs, um, you know, and expand it um, nationwide, um, you know, and have them, the kids participate in or instead of three, four weeks. And that's it. It's over six to nine months, similar what to what it is here or in Europe. In Portugal, it's a little bit different. We were there prior to um, COVID and uh, we had residential facilities. I'm sure you've seen with Patrick Leal and Matthew Leal. You know, they were there too. Uh, Patrick just, big up Patrick, big up Matthew. Um, they, uh, Patrick made his debut in Syria, which we're proud of. Um, but there's been a, quite a few players that, you know, have come through the system. You know, we had a residential facility. The kids trained and played and, you know, they played for different clubs and, you know, were pursuing their European dreams. The difference is this go around is that now we're going to have our own first team, which we're excited about. Um, it's going to be in a city in Nazare, which is on the ocean, beautiful beaches. Um, and, you know, the coaches from Portugal, they're here currently um, training and evaluating players. But kids will have an opportunity to go and experience a different culture, play, train. And, you know, if you're age appropriate, compete for a spot and see where it goes. One of the things, one of the many things uh, that I love about Vallejo is that it's an equal opportunity club. It does not matter where you come from. If you have a love for soccer and a desire to get better, Vallejo has a place for you here. Can you describe a little bit more just in detail about the motivation behind, you know, the fully funded aspects that Vallejo offers? Um, I mean, so where I'm from, you know, back in the days, if you're good, you didn't pick pay any money people wanted you to play for them but you know come to the u.s it's a very expensive sport in the united states um and and for i could see why i give an example to rent a turf field is 200 dollars an hour so just to have practice is 300 dollars. you know each time you step on the field so so there's a reason why it's expensive but a lot of people and kids can't afford that and families can't afford that. So from the start, like we started in inner city um, and that was just to try and provide opportunity and access. And those are the two words we, we, we almost live by is provide opportunity and access. And obviously, if you're talented, uh, you know, the access to the better leagues, access to, you know, try out and show your show your stuff to you know, college coaches or professional coaches, those are the things. So um, so what we try to do is if you have game or if you have some character, it doesn't matter how much money you have in your pocket, we'll find a place. And that's how it's always been from the start. Not only that, but Vallejo is, as, a, as an entire club, is incredibly passionate about philanthropy and, and making sure that the clubs gives back to the community. I don't, I personally don't know of many clubs, if any at all, that are doing anything like what Vallejo does in that regard. What was, for you, what was the inspiration to include that in the club's mission? Um, well, I mean, before there's football, there's people. And not, you know, the, the life is not fair. And people oftentimes need help. So I think that um, the, the act of giving is, you know, shows your character. Um, so, so we ask of the kids. You know, we don't ask anything of the parents, but we say, hey, because we treat the kids as independent entities that, you know, you should give off yourself, you know, and, and you know, that's that should be a measure of a person is how much that they give. Um, so whether it's the food drives that they organize or, you know, different kids have started their own nonprofits that we that we have supported and which I'm like just the entrepreneurial nature of that. I'm appreciative of that and and respect that um, respect those initiatives to the most. 
um, you know, in Dorchester, you know, there's Thanksgiving or they do the street cleanups and there's a ton of things that just, we just, that just aren't publicized, but it's something that is woven um, in the fabric of this club and that, hey, you know, we're going to do, we're going to try and improve the world and have an impact. There are way too many ordinary people around. So <laughs> this is one way you could define yourself by, by actually giving and trying to improve the world in some way, shape or form. I, I, I genuinely, I'm going to repeat it again. I don't think, I don't know of too many other clubs that are doing that. I think it's one of the reasons I'm so proud to be here as a part of the club as well. Along with that, I mean, there's so many exciting things happening right now at the club. What are you, Amelia, what are you most looking forward to seeing where this club is heading? I mean, my goals are very simple. Um, we have great people here. So my job really is to either give them the resources or find the resources for them to pursue their mission and to help them, whether they're the kids or the coaches or the directors. Um, you know, but I'm excited for, I'm excited to come come every single day. Like today, I coach the U8s and the U7s. I make sure it doesn't matter where in the world I am. I hurry back to make sure I am at training and practice because they do hold me accountable as I hold them accountable. So today I'm just excited that we have, today we have fun day. We have tournaments today. So, you know, the kids have been looking forward to it. So, you know, but there's a ton of things that we're doing, whether the new fields that we're building or the new applications that we're trying to create or coming up with innovative ways of teaching the game or how can we have more fun basically <laughs> basic things um yeah we have a healthy r d <laughs> um, uh, budget and focus i would say amelia i really want to thank you for for taking the time today and hopping on the podcast oh, oh, oh uh, thank you for having me yeah. it's a pleasure it's a privilege no no you know what the pleasure is mine i'm so glad <laughs> you enjoyed it guys thank you for those who are listening thank you for those who have been watching as well this has been the Vallejo Values Podcast. Thank you again to Amelia Williams for coming on. I have been your host, Carter Hockman, and we'll see you guys next time.